in one way or the other throughout the Bible and especially the New Testament. We are taught to be reasonable. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, we can't be what we don't have the ability to be. God created us intellectual and rational creatures. He recognizes that in giving us the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And he understands that we must exercise our will to intellectually, which means reasonably, study the Bible. When it comes to the matter of preaching the truth, preaching the gospel, preaching the word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, then we are to preach it in a reasonable manner. When you read, and this is just one example of Acts chapter 24, when Paul is a Appearing before Felix. Luke records this. And as he, that is the Apostle Paul, reasoned. Mark that. Reasoned of righteousness, temperance, that's self-control. And judgment to come made an impact on Felix. Felix trembled. Felix understood what he was saying. It impacted him. And he answers, go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season I will call for thee. But no matter how well the seed was sown, the truth was taught, and he understood it, it was not in the disposition of Felix to repent of his wicked ways and obey the gospel. The point I'm making regarding teaching the truth, which all Christians are expected to do, according to their several abilities, is that in preaching the truth, one teaches, and in teaches, one is reasoning with his hearers. Whether he's writing something to them as you read the New Testament in words, or whether it's like I'm trying to do now, or standing more in a classroom situation, or whether it's visiting with a neighbor across the back fence in the front yard, and you're dealing with matters pertaining to the truth of God. Some people today in this emotional clamor that goes on and has for many, many years in religion confuse conversion with a convulsion. Well, it's not the case. When a person is truly converted to Jesus Christ, his life is completely changed. It is changed by the truth he's heard and understood and applied to his life. And that came through the proper use and honesty and the use of it of his intellect, his rational powers. We need to appeal to people on the rational level. That is, cause them to depend upon the powers God gave them naturally, which is their intellectual powers to gather information and to reason with it. And so Paul preached the gospel. And in defense of himself as an apostle of Christ and what he preached to Felix, he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. I would suggest that one of the hallmarks or cardinal marks of a gospel sermon is that it is reasoning with the people to whom it is preached. It is saying, think with me. Consider the evidence. What does that mean for you? Here are the facts in the case. Let's reason from them and arrive at a conclusion. Thus, we have admonitions to Christians concerning godly living. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. If you're not an intellectual, rational person, you can't do that. Impossible to do that. 
So as the Holy Spirit had Paul write that, as is true, the whole Word of God, Old and New Testaments, then he's appealing to the intellectual powers of those who would read it and the thinking that they would do. When you're teaching your children in a home, reason with them. Teach them early on the importance of reasoning. Use simple matters that they at that particular stage of life can use when it comes to thinking through a thing. And that's what I mean when I say reason is thinking through a thing. Now, with that as an introduction, I want to emphasize in this sermon that there is no middle ground, no middle ground at all between truth and error, none whatsoever. There is in this world today, has been for a long time, and I've seen it in most of my preaching career grow and develop in the churches among certain people. And it is the belief that men can hold contradictory doctrines on matters of the faith, as Jude used it. We studied this morning in the back class, Jude 3, and still be acceptable to God. And that's just not the case. It's not, first of all, rational. It's irrational to teach such a thing. It is ultimately a rejection of saving truth. I want us to consider for a moment the laws of human thought. Now you can say, well, man must have invented those. No, man analyzed what he was, and just like grammar, when it comes to a sentence, then he labeled it and identified it and defined it so he could refer to it. As I've said on multiple occasions concerning a verb in a sentence, a verb was doing what a verb does in a sentence long before anybody called it a verb. That's for sake of identification and definition. And the same is true when you investigate the thinking that all of us do. And we do some of it so much we don't even know we are. I'll show you one of those. And you, you probably have already done it today. When you pull up to a four-way stop, meaning stop signs in an intersection, you already know that when you're the last one to pull up that stop sign, you stop and the other person goes. Now you learn that. Intellectually, you grasp that. You pull up to a stoplight. If it's red, all things working as they're meant to, people, of course, respecting the laws they should, you pull up and that red is facing you, you stop. And you know, going the other way, people have green and they're moving. Now, there can be exceptions, but I'm talking about what is routine. And you do that without even thinking. Now, because people don't abide by the law and because people do things that suits them, you may be even more precautious or cautious and be careful because some people run red lights. I understand that. But we're simply looking at the reason there is such a thing as a traffic light and what it was meant to do. So we do that kind of thing regularly. And we have to pause and say, well, did I go to school to learn that? Well, it wasn't since you did. You had to be taught it somewhere, come to a knowledge of it. And you had to be capable of coming to a knowledge of it and to think with it to be able to do it. So the laws of human thought. Of course, there are other needs. And while there are other needs that we need to look at, when it comes to going to heaven, when it comes to pleasing God, when it comes to understanding the Bible and applying it to our lives, there's no greater need among God's people today than to reaffirm in their thinking, which they do, the long-known fact of what I said this sermon was about, that there's no middle ground between truth and error. I would simply say this is one of the fundamental laws of human thought. Now, 
so far as propositions are concerned, if you want to speak formally, a proposition is only a sentence that claims something. That's all it is. A precisely stated proposition is a sentence that makes a claim. Let me give you an example. The baptism of the Great Commission is for the remission of sins. Now there's a sentence. Makes a claim, doesn't it? Certain baptism is for the remission of sins. So if you don't understand that, then you need to understand how you come to understand that. But first of all, there has to be the law of identity. Well, that sure sounds hard to me. No, it doesn't. Can you be identified to be who you are? And are there ways of doing it? Yes. And is that important? Yes. I dare say you use your driver's license more to identify yourself and prove you are who you are as well as other things than you do uh, in other ways. So the law of identity is something we handle every day. Knock, knock at the door and you say, who's there? <laughs> what are you seeking to do <laughs> to identify who's knocking on your door? We do it in all sorts of things. So the law of identity. If a proposition is true, it's true. That's all you're saying. It corresponds with reality. It corresponds with the facts. So when I say the baptism of the Great Commission is for the remission of sins, I have to ask, does that correspond with the facts? That means I've got to study the facts. And that gives me back to studying the scriptures. No wonder Jesus said to the Jews of his day, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. Now, the second law of human thought I want to look at is the one we mentioned several times already. The law of the excluded middle. Now, you know, I never will forget after I left college, I went back over to that same college. And uh, Brother Warren and some others were having a discussion and there must have been seven, 800 people in the audience. It was a special discussion on marriage, divorce, remarriage. And brother, the late brother Thomas B. Warren referred as if everybody there understood, but especially teachers in the Bible department of that college. And he referred to the law of the excluded middle. I never will forget the look, and I could call his name, but I won't on a fellow who I'd known for a long time who was a teacher in that department. He kind of had this, what in the world is the law of the excluded middle? Anybody that teaches the Bible as the Lord wants the Bible to teach, to be taught, must understand that there's no middle ground between truth and error, and that's all we're saying. That's all we're saying. Now, follow me. We'll use some letters of the alphabet. A proposition such as P, we'll say Paul, we'll just P, is either true or false. If P stands for a proposition, we'll say that proposition is either true or false. There's no middle ground. It's either true or false. And number three, The law of contradiction. Well, does that sound awful formal? The law of contradiction. Well, that simply is saying that a proposition P cannot be both true and false. In other words, Andrew can't both be Devon's husband and not be Devon's husband. Is that hard to understand? It's that simple. And these laws are given in a book that I have, and it's an older book. They're found in many logic textbooks. Logic and Introduction by Professor Lionel Ruby. So there are three laws. I think I gave all three of them. Three laws of thought. Now, whether you knew to call them that, those 
particular terms or the particular names that identify them. You use them all the time. If you were to walk up to your child and say, I'm your father, but I'm not your father. Are any of your kids smart enough if he's listening and understanding and old enough to understand what father and I'm your father and I'm not your father mean? Are they going to look at you and say, I'm so glad I have such a smart daddy? Well, of course, kids can understand it when they don't even know how to put the laws of thought or into sentence form. So all we're doing is simply saying what you do every day, all day long. Has long ago been set into the laws of human thought so we could talk about them. And I think you see that all these laws of thought are important. But special attention will be given in this sermon to the law of the excluded middle. Because I think this is the one which is most pertinent to current problems and has been for many, many years. Yes, even among brethren. Now, in setting forth this law, again referring back to Lionel Ruby, a logician, had this to say, a proposition is either true or false, there is no middle ground between truth and falsity. That's a very brief comment. You're either in this building right now or you're not. Now, can you tell the difference? If not, some way somebody find that person so I can dodge him. Now, here's a longer quotation. A fellow by the name of Jevons said this, W.S. Jevons, concerning the law that stood in the middle. The thing can't be true and false at the same time. There's no middle ground. It's either true or false. He says of this, its meaning may best be explained by saying that it is impossible to mention anything and any quality or circumstance without allowing that the quality or circumstance either belongs to the thing or does not belong. The name of the law, law of excluded middle, expresses the fact that there's no third or middle course. The answer must be yes or no. We might say true or false. Let the thing be rock and the quality hard then the rock must be either hard or not hard. Gold must be either white or not white. A line must be either straight or not straight. An action must be either virtuous or not virtuous. That's elementary, his work, Elementary Lessons in Logic, page 119. Now, I realize I'm being kind of formal, and yet I'm trying to show you that this was all involved in the mind of God and in the mind of the apostles, or else we would not be commanded to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. First Thessalonians 5.21, and Paul would not have, as he did in other places, as Luke records in Acts, reasoned with people as he preached the gospel to them. Now I want to look at some of the current, I say current, it's been many years, but still current opposition to the truth of this law. And by the way, what I'm dealing with here, as far as refuting it, permeates this society. Because it comes back to your truth, my truth, their truth, who knows, does everybody get along? Well, that won't work. So some are contending that when they're opposing views, as to whether or not a proposition is true or not true. One must be careful not to be what they call, and here's that term rises up, legalistic, and say that the proposition is either 100% true or 
100% false. Now let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Such opposition to the truthfulness of the law of the excluded middle. That's what I'm dealing with. Remember, and I'll keep saying that. Let it be supposed that there's a certain, we're back to our proposition P. There's a certain precisely stated proposition, a sentence that makes a claim, proposition P. Let it be further supposed that man A says proposition P is true. Let it still be further supposed that man B, as in Baker, says proposition P is not true. And let it still be further supposed that man C says, since man A and man B differ in these views, how can I know which one is right? How can they know which one is right? It seems to me that there's good to be said for the views of both men. A and B. And that either one of them would be somewhat quite arrogant to say that his own view is 100% right and the other view is 100% wrong. Which, by the way, is basically an agnostic position. He's saying, I can't know. Now, you, you don't think people would be that way. But they are. Many years ago, when the marriage, divorce, remarriage thing was new and it was being fought heatedly in the 80s and even late 70s and early 80s, in Austin, Texas, there was one particular church. And the elders in that church said, well, now, Brother Tom Warren is a very smart man, very learned man. He has a Ph.D., teaches in our colleges. And Brother Bales, J.D. Bales, both of them passed from this earth. I knew both of them, had classes under Brother Bales. He's a smart man. He's got a Ph.D. He knows a lot of Bible. Both of them written all sorts of books and had debates. And they disagree on the matter of marriage, divorce, remarriage. These elders sat before a preacher and said, how can we know what is right when you got these two men disagreeing with one another? Do you realize what that said about their view of truth, about their view of understanding the Bible, about their own personal responsibility to God to ascertain the truth and to study the Bible? But that's reality. That's the way people are. And a lot of people run from the differences that exist over matters of truth, and I'm emphasizing matters of truth, because they don't get in a, a discussion. How far do you read, and I'll just take the New Testament for example, into the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how far do you read into those books that you don't find him in great battles on the basis of right and wrong? How far do you read into Acts before you see Great battles between Paul and others, between what's right and what's wrong. How far can you go into the epistles of the New Testament written to Christians concerning living faithful before you see all manner of error refuted and truth stated and the obligation of Christians to stand up for what's right? How can you stand up for right, right if you don't know what's right? Well, it's good on both sides. We just go down the middle. Well, I remind you, there's no middle ground between truth and error. I'm not talking about differences in opinions of whether you like crappie or bass, one over the other. Not at all. I'm talking about the truth that Jesus talked about in John 8, 31 and 32. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Do you realize taking this position that, well, there's good on both sides in the matter of truth that Jesus talked about, that why even have a Bible? Why would God even put the Bible in the world? 
Now, man's C in our illustrations position amounts to upholding this particular view. And this is out there all around us. Man cannot really find truth and therefore cannot ever be sure that his own views are right and that opposing views are wrong. How would you like to go through life feeling that way, thinking that way? The writer of the Bible, God, did not set forth things that way. And we today, if we're true Christians, as the New Testament uses that word and defines it, we won't either. What we set forth here is several false views. Now, the law of the excluded middle applied to some, we'll say it this way, concrete propositions. In order to help in understanding what the law of the excluded middle is and how important it is, then I want you to consider some propositions. And these aren't just things pulled out of thin air. These are things people have actually got themselves into. Let me give you proposition number one. Not hard to understand. The Bible teaches there is one God. Let me say that again. The Bible teaches there is one God. Well, let us uh, look at this proposition and suppose that man A says the proposition is true. Further suppose man B says the proposition is not true. Well, then here comes man C, and he says the proposition is neither true or false. There's some good to be said for the view of man A and Man B. Further, suppose man D says, when there are opposing viewpoints, who can tell what is right? After all, each one thinks he's right. And this person says, my view of the matter is to be guided by love and agree to disagree. Now, I have been facing that kind of thing all my preaching career. I saw it begin and grow, and it's out there. It's a false concept of biblical love. We've spent a lot of time on that. But nevertheless, th this false concept says let's agree to disagree because they think love is the most important thing, but it's a corrupt definition of love that they use. They'll say it doesn't matter whether or not we agree on the truthfulness or falsity of this proposition. Well, let me ask you, does it matter to you as to whether we agree on this proposition? The Bible teaches there's one God. By the way, in the God Egg class I've been on, just throw it out the window. <laughs> if, there, if there's not one God or if there's more than one God. So surely you need to be thinking about what this is as to the position you hold concerning the proposition the Bible teaches there's one God. But let me give you another proposition. The Bible teaches that the believer in Christ must, it's obligatory, must be baptized in water in order to have one sins, the believer's sins washed away by the blood of Christ. Well, let's go back through our little approach to things. Let's just suppose that man A says the proposition is true. Then man B says proposition is not true. It's false. Then here comes man C again and says, well, the proposition is neither true nor false. There's some good to be said for the view of man A, and there's some good to be said for the view of man B. Then, as I said earlier, further suppose, here comes man D, and he says, when there are opposing viewpoints, who can tell who's right? So his judgment is that uh, let us be guided by love and agree to disagree. Because love, you see, is the important thing. It doesn't matter whether or not we agree on the truthfulness or falsity of the proposition. After all, each one thinks he's right. Now, what's the proposition? 
The Bible teaches that the believer in Christ must be baptized in water in order to have his sins washed away by the blood of Christ. Where are you on that? Here's the last one, proposition number three. The Bible teaches that Christians are to eat the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week and only on the first day of the week. Well, now about this proposition, we'll go back through these same men, A, B, and so on. Man A says the proposition is true. Then man B comes along and says the proposition is not true, it's false. A man C comes along and says the proposition is neither true nor false. There's some good to be said for the view of man A, and there's some good to be said for the view of man B. Well, man D has to be heard from, and he says when there are opposing viewpoints, who can tell who's right? So I say let's be guided by love, and while we agree to disagree, let's extend the hand of fellowship to all, because love is the important thing. So it doesn't matter whether or not we agree on the truthfulness or the falsity of the proposition. After all, each one thinks he's right. And how can any of us ever know who's right? What was the proposition? The Bible teaches that Christians are to eat the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week and only on the first day of the week. Now, where do you fall? A, B, C, or D? Well, we expect to evaluate these things. See, everything I'm doing this morning says you've got a brain, you've got a mind, you're intellectual, you've got to think straight, you've got to prove all things old fast, that which is good. You've got to consider the facts in the case. You've got to think with those facts. And you've got to arrive at the right conclusion. So of the views that we just went through, my comment is a reaction to those, these A, B, and C fellas. The view of man A is correct. Each one of these is true. The view of man B is wrong. The view of man C is wrong and absurd. The view of man D is both wrong and absurd. And that's because of the law that's through the middle. There's no middle ground between truth and error. It's just truth. Or you can't make heads or tails out of John 8, 31 and 32. Or in Jesus' prayer, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see, that's a proposition. Precisely stated proposition. God's word is truth. That's either true or false. So there's evidence that loose, not loose, but loose, views are being held by a host of members of the church and certainly out here in the world and the things that they do. And you see that all around. Homosexuality is sin. True or false. And you can go right down the line. Lying. To lie is to sin. Well, I have to define lie. It's a falsehood. Well, falsehood that implies there's a standard that's truth and somebody's gone against it. So you, get, you see, it all goes back to truth. So that hits morals and religion. If these views that we've been talking about that are wrong, I've illustrated the best I could, if they are right, they're true, what, and I asked this already, what good is the revelation of God's word to us when it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Now what sense does John 12, 48 make? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. 
how they read when they were revealed, how they read now 2,000 years later, and how they read at the end of time as we stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of deeds done in the body is going to all be the same. And the law, the excluded middle, there's no middle ground between truth and error, will be there. Now we need to understand this. And when you read the inspired apostle Paul, he plainly taught that the believing and the following of a false doctrine would damn one's soul. Plainly taught it. Listen to what he said to the Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 9. You know this. It's been quoted most often. And it's either true or not true. True or false. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels... In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. But he goes on to talk about the righteous. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And then the last verse, verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what I conclude for me at the end of this, and I've learned it a long time ago. Here's what I conclude. Preach the word. Contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And how can anybody know how their mind works, the mind God gave you intellectually and rationally, and how God communicates to us the truth that sets us free and come to any other conclusion. Now, you know, in doing this, we studied this morning just exactly when God remits a person's sins. It's not at the point of belief only in Christ. It's not at the point of repenting of one's sins, though essential, Acts 17.30. It's not at the point of one confessing one's faith in Christ that is the Son of God, Romans 10.10. 10. All of those, as was pointed out at another time from this pulpit, are unto salvation. They're headed in the way of salvation, and they are essential. But one gets into Christ by being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26, especially 27. There's no other way. There's no if, hands, or buts about it. That's what the good book says. That's the way one becomes a Christian, and in no other way. When you do that, the Lord adds you to his church, not some denomination made by man, sustained by the commandments and doctrines of men, but the Lord's church, Acts 2, verse 47. And one continues steadfastly, faithfully to the Lord, living the Christian life, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. To the child of God, you know when you're right or wrong. But I tell you, members of the church who engaged in one or more wrongs, they will do in their own minds. That's how they see themselves. What many do all around us. Well, I don't know. Other people do wrong too. and They're good people. I like what one preacher said one time. When you start thinking that way, when you know exactly what the Bible says, those thoughts are nothing but the devil talking to you. So if you need to obey the gospel to become a Christian, now's the time to do it. Child of God, if you sin, need to repent, confess those sins, pray God for forgiveness. Now's the time to do that. And so we urge you to do what we stand and say.